Picture this scene. It's sometime in the early 20th century, deep in the Sierra Norte Mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico, and two young sisters are playing in the woods. Neither over the age of 10, their agenda-free wandering eventually finds them resting in the shade of a large tree. It is here, protected by the shade, growing in the damp soil, one of the sisters spots a cluster of uniquely shaped mushrooms. Immediately identifying their species as the same kind their local curandero uses to heal the sick, she reaches down, carefully harvests a few individual toadstools, and exclaims, If I eat you, you, and you, I know that you will make me sing beautifully before consuming them fresh. The girl, a young Maria Sabina, perhaps the most well-known indigenous figure in the history of psychedelia, can't have known the significance of her actions at the time but this innocent decision would put her on a path that would eventually affect herself, her community, and the whole world in ways entirely out of her control. The story of Maria's first interaction with the divine mushroom comes from an oral interview with her conducted much later in life, so there's little in documentation about the details of her early usage. However, it is evident the impactful introduction soon led her to a life devoted to healing using the sacred powers that had affected her so greatly at such a young age. Although her specific date of birth is unknown, baptism records from her parish indicate she was born in early to mid-1894. Raised in the small, mountainous town of Waulta de Jimenez, or Tejao in the native Mazatec language, Maria's largely indigenous community was increasingly becoming westernized by the time she was born. While less significantly influenced in the more populous regions of Mexico, the Catholic Church had rooted itself in the area by the latter half of the 19th century entirely changing generations of religious practice. Still, due to the predominantly Mazatec population and the community's acceptance and consistent attendance of Catholic Mass, it seems their traditional practices were too accepted by the area's Catholic leaders. This, of course, included shamanism and the use of mushrooms with mind-altering qualities for religious ceremonies. There is in fact written record of Maria Sabina's local bishop stating that these practices do not compete with the church and that all those he had known to consume the divine mushroom had too attended Mass. Because the first written account of Maria's life did not come until the mid-50s, more on that later, her journey into shamanism is only loosely documented and in the past tense. However, there is an anecdote of a time when her uncle was sick and many local shamans attempted to cure him with various herbs to no avail. As his condition worsened, Maria took the divine mushrooms, and their guidance soon led her to the correct herbs. As the story goes, after just a few days of taking Maria's remedy, her uncle was completely cured. From a young age, it seems she was destined for a life of healing, providing a revered service to a community who had long counted on people like her to continue what for them were truly holy and divine experiences. And this is exactly how she would have spent her time on Earth, had it not been for an American banker turned amateur mycologist. Robert Gordon Wasson was born on September 22, 1898, in Great Falls, Montana. A seemingly work-driven individual, Wasson spent his early adulthood as a banker, eventually becoming the vice president of public relations for J.P. Morgan in 1943. An avid writer, he published his first book that same year, detailing the Hall Carbine Affair. While certainly of historical importance, the details do not serve for this story, so, in short, John Piermont Morgan, of J.P. Morgan, was accused of wartime profiteering, and Vassan attempted to exonerate Morgan through his debut book, so real company man. Despite being in the world of money and business, Vassan was quite the mycophile, crediting his Russian-American wife, Valentina Pavlovna, for introducing him to what would become a lifelong passion. It all started on their honeymoon. As Robert Gordon tells it, it was 1927 and the newlyweds were enjoying a stay in the Catskill Mountains. On a walk, his wife suddenly rushed off the trail, over to a patch of wild mushrooms, caressing the toadstools, calling them by their Russian names. Robert Gordon, on the other hand, notes that, quote, Like all good Anglo-Saxons, I knew nothing about the fungal world, and felt the less I knew about those putrid, treacherous excrescences, the better. End quote. That night, Wasson says his wife carefully cleaned the mushrooms before eating them alone. While he went to bed thinking he would, as he says, wake up a widower. However, when he saw his wife had survived the night unscathed, he was quickly infatuated with the world of mycology. He claims that from that very day, 
the two decided to dedicate themselves to seeking knowledge from mushrooms, not through books and research from afar, but by experiencing firsthand the powers the mushrooms so clearly possessed. Before we get to Wasan and Sabino's first meeting, it's important to understand where psychedelic research was at this point in time. The story of Albert Hoffman's first encounter with LSD has been well documented and told a thousand times over, but here's a quick recap. Hoffman was a Swiss chemist who, on November 16, 1938, became the first human to ever synthesize LSD, or lysergic acid diethylamide. This was 100% a mistake. At the time, Hoffman was working for a Swiss company called Sandoz Laboratories, attempting to create a stimulant for the pharmaceutical department. While the newly synthesized LSD did excite the lab's test animals, it was not what Sandoz was looking for. Hoffman set this failed experiment aside until April 16, 1943, when he decided to give it another look and accidentally absorbed a small amount through his fingertips. After an intriguingly overwhelming and emotionally altering experience, Hoffman deliberately took a larger dose of 250 micrograms three days later on April 19th. Within an hour, he began experiencing much more dramatic, mind-altering sensations than before. So intense, in fact, he requested his lab assistant escort him home. As was the common means of transportation of the time and place, the two commuted by bicycle. Along the ride, Hoffman's psyche began spiraling into nightmarish, anxiety-ridden thoughts. He believed his next-door neighbor was an evil witch. He thought he was going insane that the LSD had poisoned him and he would never be the same. When the house doctor he requested arrived shortly thereafter, he was unable to detect any health complications or physical abnormalities, save for a pair of extremely dilated pupils. Once the doctor had assured Hoffman he was not dying or losing his mind, the experience shifted into heightened feelings of joy and empathy. When he closed his eyes, kaleidoscopic colors danced beneath his eyelids. This event proved to Hoffman a mistake from a half-decade prior was in fact a remarkable scientific discovery, leading him down a path that would become a lifetime exploration into psychedelia. A patron saint of sorts in the psychedelic subculture, Hoffman's April 19th experience, coined Bicycle Day, is still celebrated to this day. So, if you happen to see a group of particularly animated cyclists on this date, I'm just saying. While Hoffman and his Swiss peers had the time and resources to invest in psychotherapy, much of the planet was in the midst of World War II, meaning the scientists and budgets of some of the most powerful nations on Earth were largely focused on finding ways to kill people by the masses as effectively as possible. Psychedelic research did not really take off until the 1950s, after Sandoz, realizing the potential of Hoffman's discovery, had begun sending doses of LSD to universities and laboratories across the world. The result was a gold rush of research. As professors, psychologists, scientists, and even the CIA begin to learn just how powerful this newly synthesized molecule truly was, psychedelic research began expanding beyond Hoffman's happy mistake. Things like MDMA, initially synthesized in 1912 while chemists were attempting to develop substances that stopped abnormal bleeding, and mescaline, a psychoactive compound naturally found in the peyote cactus and initially synthesized in 1918, both became heavily studied as chemists and researchers started to understand the power of psychoactive substances. One of these now well-known substances that had yet to reach the labs was, of course, psilocybin. Despite being used by communities worldwide, the compound had never been synthesized and in fact never been named, the term psilocybin coming from none other than Hoffman himself, but we'll get to that. The beginning of psilocybin's use as a clinically researched substance would, of course, come to fruition as a direct result of the Wasan's expedition to a rural, indigenous community in Oaxaca, Mexico. So, as R. Gordon documented, he and his wife did in fact dedicate themselves to a lifelong passion in mycology, traveling around the globe to get up close and personal with the divine mushroom, as they had so desired. Their research, while in-depth and impassioned, was still amateur. Remember, Wasan was a banker who attended the London School of Economics, and while his wife had studied to become a pediatrician, neither held degrees in ethnomycology, botany, or anthropology. The couple's inexperience likely played a part in some of their faulty hypotheses regarding mycology. For example, Wasan theorized that each Indo-European culture identified as either a mycophobe or a mycophile, believing cultures either knew and loved the fungal world wholeheartedly or rejected it entirely. He classified Russians and Catalans as mycophiles, 
each with a rich history of fungal usage, and giving the title of mycophobes to the Celts and Scandinavians, among others. Now, in 2021, it's well documented that cultures of modern-day Ireland and Scandinavia ingested mushrooms for ritual practices, like communities quite literally all over the world. The concept of worldwide mushroom usage was actually grasped fully by the Wassons, who began researching beyond Indo-European communities, looking into the traditional usage of mushrooms across just about every continent. It's this research that ultimately led them to Mexico. At some point, the Wassons began researching documents from 16th century Mesoamerica, Spanish written documents noting the Aztecs' use of certain mushrooms for religious celebrations in what they described as demonic Holy Communion. Fascinated and quick to observe a lack of research in this region and practice, the couple, their daughter, and Robert Gordon's friend slash New York photographer Alan Richardson set off for Mexico in the summer of 1955. Even by the mid-20th century, Huitla de Jimenez had remained a predominantly indigenous community in their practices and in the overall makeup of the town's population. Of course, the Catholicism that had been around when Maria Sabina was a young girl remained, but up until this point, Western influence was largely confined to religious ideologies. This isn't to say church and religious practices are not an incredibly valued and important part of people's lives. It's just meant to point out that this was still the most visible source of Western influence, and that Huotla de Jimenez in the mid-50s would not have appeared vastly different than it had at the turn of the 20th century. The Wasan's group did not originally seek or know about Huotla de Jimenez upon departing from Mexico. Instead, they began researching in areas thought to contain both mushrooms and the communities of individuals who consumed them, which ultimately led them to the mountains of Oaxaca. The way Robert Gordon tells it, his first experience with Maria Sabina came from the help of a Huotla de Jimenez resident named Filamon. As one of the local leaders, as well as one of the few who could speak Spanish, he welcomed Lasan, who was quick to get to the point of his visitation. Because no cameras were rolling, I'll let Wasan give his account of the interaction. Quote, I asked him earnestly and in a low voice if I could speak to him in confidence. Instantly curious, he encouraged me. Will you? I went on. Help me. Learn the secrets of the divine mushroom. And I used the Mixteco name, Ni Shito, correctly pronouncing it with glottal stop and tonal differentiation of the syllables. When Philemon recovered from his surprise, he said warmly that nothing could be easier. End quote. Whether Philemon truly needed recovery time, or even that Wasan nailed the pronunciation of a word whose language he did not speak seems questionable at best. Nonetheless, Philemon asked him to pass by his house in the late afternoon. So, later that day, Wasan and his photographer Richardson met at Philemon's property, where they were quickly led down a damp ravine where the divine mushrooms were, as Wassam puts it, growing in abundance. Richardson photographed the fungus before the three men gathered a good portion in a cardboard box and headed straight past Philemon's house and up to a hill to meet the town's curandera, the Spanish word for healer or shaman. Now, while Wassam could not have possibly foreseen the cultural shift his expedition would throttle forward in full force, there are signs he felt this could be a revolutionary finding and made some effort to protect the people of Huotla de Jimenez. For example, he did not reveal the name of the municipality, or even that they were in the state of Oaxaca, simply saying that they were in the remote mountains of Mexico. Further, he gave Maria Sevina the pseudonym Eva Mendez, in hopes of keeping her identity and the region unidentifiable. By the time the two Americans met Maria Sevina, or simply the Señora, as she had come to be known, she was well into her middle age, with an adult daughter who too had become a curandera. When the men arrived at the house, Wasan was immediately moved by Maria Sevina, noting a, quote, spirituality in her expression that struck us at once. She had presence, end quote. Wasan says Maria and her daughter cried out in rapture over the firmness, the fresh beauty, and abundance of our young specimens. Soon, it was time to drop the question. Through an interpreter, Wasan asked the women if he and Richardson could be served later that night. The preceding interaction is up for debate, but it is alleged Maria Sabina asked why, as the men appeared they did not need healing. Wasan, fearing rejection, 
allegedly replied he was concerned about the well-being and whereabouts of his son, when in fact, he knew his child was perfectly safe. Whether this happened or not is really hard to say. What is known is Maria and her daughter accepted and agreed to let the outsiders partake in a ceremony that very night. I know this story is becoming very wasan centric but because he was the first documented Westerner to visit Maria and the first person anywhere to document the expedition, his first-hand accounts and Richardson's photos serve as some of the best records of Maria Sabina and what a real Curandera-led ritualistic experience looked like before these became regular monetized vacations. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Wasan and Richardson did not undergo their mushroom ceremony alone. In keeping with tradition, they underwent the experience with around 20 other individuals, all besides the two white men being Mixteco-speaking locals. They gathered in a large room of Philemon's house, the interior only lit by candlelight. Prior to ingesting the divine mushrooms, Wasan notes the friendly environment he and Richardson found themselves in, not feeling like, as he says, strange white men, but rather a part of the community. Besides the two uh, not strange white men, uh, everyone else was dressed in their best clothes. The women wearing huipiles, uh, traditional colorful dresses found in various parts of Mesoamerica, while the men wore all white topped with beautifully patterned serapes, the traditional blankets of this region of Mexico. At around 8 p.m., all were served warm chocolate to drink prior to mushroom ingestion, something Wasan recalled being documented by a Spanish writer while in Mexico. And, if anyone knows anything about modern psychedelic culture, mushroom-infused chocolates remained one of the most popular forms of consumption. Pre-ingesting, Wasan notes that while everyone was friendly, there was no sense of gleeful anticipation noting, quote, the mushrooms are sacred and never the butt of the vulgar jocularity that is often the way of the white men with alcohol, end quote. Soon, the senora began cleaning the mushrooms of large spots of dirt before blessing them with prayer and burning resin incense, all done before a small, simple altar featuring various Christian images, this being the most clear example of European influence throughout the ceremony. Wasan describes being on the tiptoe of expectancy, as nearly 30 years of research were now culminating in this one experience. Richardson, on the other hand, had apparently promised his wife he would not let those nasty toadstools cross his lips, and uh, appeared heavily conflicted before ingesting, muttering as he did so, My God, what will Mary say? The process of actually eating the mushrooms took nearly half an hour, Starting at around 10.30, everyone was handed approximately the same dosage and began eating them slowly, taking their time. Wilson notes the bad, acrid taste paired with an equally rancid odor. The goal for the two visitors was to stay sharp throughout to better document the experience. But, as Wilson puts it, our resolve soon melted before the onslaught of the mushrooms. At just about midnight, as the mushrooms began to take effect, Maria Savina plucked a flower from the altar and snuffed the only remaining lit candle, sending the group into complete darkness. Soon, Alan, feeling the chills, wrapped himself in a blanket. A few minutes later, he whispered, Gordon, I am seeing things. Hassan replied, quote, I told them not to worry. I was too. End quote. Wasan describes the imagery as emerging from the center of his field of vision, coming in waves, slow-paced, fast-paced, coming whether his eyes were open or closed, vivid colors, the kinds of patterns that could be found on textiles, wallpapers, those which soon evolved into more concise, clearer images, castles, palaces surrounded by pristine, beautiful gardens. Throughout the night, Maria Sabina and her daughter remained active, Having consumed twice as many mushrooms as the others, the women began to perform song and dance, the mushrooms speaking through them, as Wasan puts it. He recalls, From time to time, the singing would rise to a climax, then suddenly stop. And then, the senora would fling forth spoken words, violent, hot, crisp words that cut the darkness like a knife. Every so often, the women would hold brief intermissions, while Maria Sabina relaxed and smoked cigarettes, which is 
one of the most badass images ever put into my brain. So, Wasan clearly trip balls. In fact, it sounds about as perfect as a first psychedelic experience you'll read about across the internet's many forums regarding hallucinogenics. This next paragraph is kind of long, but I think it's pretty great to hear a 50-something-year-old man from the mid-20th century talk like a 19-year-old after their first term of state college. Quote, The visions were not blurred or uncertain. They were sharply focused, the lines and colors being so sharp they seemed more real to me than anything I had ever seen with my own eyes. I felt that I was now seen plain, whereas ordinary vision gives us an imperfect view. I was seeing the archetypes, the platonic ideas that underlie the imperfect images of everyday life. The thought crossed my mind. Could the divine mushrooms be the secret that lay behind the ancient mysteries? Could the miraculous mobility that I was now enjoying be the explanation for the flying witches that played so important a part in the folklore and fairy tales of northern Europe? These reflections passed through my mind at the very time I was seeing the visions, for the effect of the mushrooms is to bring about a fission of the spirit, a split of the person, a kind of schizophrenia with the rational side continuing to reason and to observe the sensations that the other side is enjoying. The mind is attached, as by an elastic cord, to the vagrant senses. End quote. At the end of the night, as the sun came up, shaken yet immensely moved, Wasan and Richardson retreated back to the house they were staying at with Valentina and the Wasan's daughter. A few days later, the two women ate the mushrooms, so go cool parents, this time in sleeping bags, with just Wasan and Richardson present. An eye-opening understanding from the women's experience was, traditional shamanistic setting or not, they experienced the same wondrous sensations and visions, Wasan's wife even at one point describing a ball in the Palace of Versailles with guests dancing in period costume to Mozart. Six weeks later, in his New York home, Robert Gordon took the mushrooms once more, this time dried. Unsure of what to expect, he reported that, quote, if anything, they had gained in their hallucinogenic potency, end quote. As can be imagined, Wasson was ecstatic. A lifelong goal accomplished. Further, he seems to be very focused and proud of being a, and this is in heavy quotations, pioneer in the field, claiming, Richardson and I were the first white men in recorded history to eat the divine mushrooms. Soon, it was time to share his findings with the world. Seeking the Magic Mushroom, a photo essay by Wasson and Richardson, was published in May of 1957 by Life magazine. The piece documented firsthand Wasson's experiences and interactions with the community of Oitla de Jimenez and the divine mushroom. All aforementioned quotes credited to Wasson come from this source. Almost immediately, Wasson's piece began affecting science and culture. Already friends with French mycologist Roger Heim, Wasson sent him various spore specimens which Heim grew into fully developed mushrooms. Seeking to understand the chemical structure of the psychoactive substances found in the mushrooms, they turned to none other than the granddaddy of them all, Albert Hoffman, who quickly got working. Like the psychoactive loving genius chemist he is, he soon isolated the mushroom's mind-altering compound, naming it psilocybin. Meanwhile, thousands of teens, young adults, artists, writers, and so-called free thinkers consumed the piece, sparking a widespread curiosity. Novelist Tom Robbins wrote in his memoir how the article advanced the concept of turning on both in himself and Americans as a whole. A cultural shift was on the horizon. Now far enough away from the horrors of World War II, domestic issues and failure of the concept of the American dream were beginning to creep to the front of people's minds, as the beatnik authors and jazz artists of the time began rejecting traditional values while exposing the inequalities and exploitation of individuals occurring in their own country. Change was in the air. The two years between Wasson's first visit and the release of his photo essay was likely the last period in Maria Sabina's life she experienced true tranquility and peace. While I could not find any written accounts about her experiences at the time, I imagine she continued life as she always had, able to dedicate herself to healing her own community. Wasson's article would completely upend this peaceful existence. While he had attempted to keep Wutla de Jimenez an anonymous site, Americans soon began to trickle in. Reports suggest Maria Sabina initially accepted just about every visitor, agreeing without external resistance, 
eventually, as psychedelia went mainstream in the United States and Europe, some of the culture's most familiar faces made visits to the Senora. Bob Dylan, Keith Richards, Mick Jagger, and the Beatles were among the biggest names to see the increasingly well-known curandera. One of the more intriguing visitations occurred in 1962, prior to the masses flowing into Huautla. Hoffman and his wife traveled to Mexico City to meet with R. Gordon Wasson, whose wife, Valentina, had passed away from cancer a few years prior. From the capital, they traveled to Huautla to see the señora. Hoffman describes Wasan and Maria Sabina as greeting each other cordially and as old friends, which, while taken from the account of a white outsider, I think gives insight to the kind of welcoming woman the señora was. That night, Maria, her two daughters, the younger of which had also become a curandera, and a curandero named Don Aurelio, joined Hoffman, his wife, and Wasan, in ingesting synthesized psilocybin pills Hoffman had created. At first, Maria Sabina was skeptical, feeling they lacked the spirit of the mushroom. However, after upping her dose as well as waiting for the more delayed breakdown of the synthesized pill, eventually she and the others began to feel the effects, entering into their traditional shamanistic rituals of chanting, singing, and praying. At one point in the night, Hoffman writes of finally being able to take the hojas de la pastora, sacred leaves he had heard possessed similarly divine qualities. While not the same hallucinogenic sensations as the mushrooms, he describes an intense state of mental sensitivity. The hojas are now sold in head shops across the United States under the name salvia. And for those of you wondering, yes, that's the Miley Cyrus salvia is legal salvia. And disclaimer, just because it's legal doesn't mean it's safe, with a high percentage of users describing nightmarish hallucinations. Plus, to many Mazatecs, the smokable version sold on American shelves is an insult to their practice of chewing the fresh leaves, the only acceptable method of ingestion in their tradition. This visitation from Hoffman holds a heightened weight because had the Swiss chemist been unable to test his psilocybin recipe through a traditional curandera like Maria Sabina, who knows how his career would have shifted, potentially changing the course of culture and science. As the 60s throttled on, and as the United States dealt with racism, assassinations, war, and inequality, its disgruntled youth sought an alternative to the myth of the American dream that seemed to be evaporating before their eyes. Soon, it was as if counterculture had become the youth culture. And during this time, records show Wodla de Jimenez began to turn into a chaotic tourist destination, void of the tranquility it had possessed for generations. Reports start coming in documenting drunken Americans sprawled throughout the town, unprepared trippers sprinting out of ceremonies, screaming, flailing around. A young man who, supposedly, charged through the streets with a live turkey in his mouth until finally being detained by authorities. Even when foreigners attempted kind gestures, such as bringing Maria Sabina gifts, they simply were giving her materials she had no use for, with reports of someone even attempting to give her a large dog, which she of course had to refuse, being without financial means to feed it. Sabina, believing it her duty to heal, attempted to take in as many as possible, but those who knew her well say each ceremony with the visitors took a little more out of her. Worse, her notoriety was blamed as the cause of all the chaos and disruption outsiders brought, leading to a large group of the community ostracizing her for the rest of her life. At one point, in a horrible act of revenge, her entire house was burned down. Although I struggled to find concrete documentation regarding the incident, multiple sources say she had a son who was murdered, presumably as yet another form of retaliation against her practices. Mexican authorities began to hear reports of the massive waves of tourism to this tiny town and soon accused Maria Sabina of being a drug dealer, at one point even jailing her for a period. This was heavily against the Mexican government's traditional approach to indigenous shamans, who were largely left to practice in peace at this time. Eventually, in the late 1960s, the Mexican government cracked down hard on drug possession and sale, leading to a decrease in mind-altering tourism, coinciding with the beginning of the Nixon years and an end of the hippie dream. So, how did Wasson feel about all the unforeseen aftermath he and his wife's expedition caused? Well, it seemed he opposed the blatant recreational approach to the mushrooms from the start. Prior to his piece being published, he pleaded with life editors to remove magic from the title for fear of it creating an unwanted allure. 
He never entered into the psychedelic subculture, was not involved in the summer of love, and never a friend of the Grateful Dead. Instead, continuing his lifelong pursuit of understanding indigenous psychoactive substances. While Sun never said he regretted traveling to Wodle de Jimenez, but he always stated his only goal was the advancement of science and knowledge. And, while this may have truly been his personal goal, Wasan's pilgrimages to Oaxaca cannot be discussed without mentioning the CIA and a little project called MK Ultra. After hearing word of Wasan's 1955 findings through the internationally networked Grapevine, the CIA immediately became interested. This was because they were currently in the midst of MK Ultra, a mind control program that involved a number of illegal practices, a great deal of which involved dosing individuals with large amounts of LSD. While describing the depths of this program could take an entire podcast season, the important thing to grasp related to Maria Sabina is that this program, started in 1953, wanted to find a substance that possessed mind-controlling qualities. Hearing about the potentially hypnosis-inducing mushrooms, the CIA provided Wasan's team with a grant through the non-existent Gersticker Fund for Medical Research. While there is no evidence to suggest Wasan knew anything about the CIA's involvement, it's just another example of the unforeseen ramifications of sharing someone else's culture with the rest of the world. Although Wasan returned to Oudle de Jimenez multiple times, eventually, toward the end of her life, Maria Sabina is quoted saying she regretted introducing him to the divine mushroom. It's hard not to blame her. A community that had once seen her as a most holy woman now pointed to her as the cause of their pain and suffering. Maria felt the Americans and foreigners did not seek the mushrooms for the right reasons. Prior to Wasan, her rituals had been for healing. After, she said they were used simply for healthy Westerners seeking God. Maria Savina died on November 22, 1985. She spent several of her later years in Mexico City seeking medical attention with the help of Alvaro Estrada, a journalist who has documented her life in multiple of his books. In one of his writings, Alvaro spoke with another curandero by the name Apolonio Teran, who offered this to say when asked about shamanistic rituals being opened up to the world. The divine mushroom no longer belongs to us. Its sacred language has been profaned. The language has been spoiled, and it is indecipherable for us. Now the mushrooms speak English. Yes, it's the tongue that the foreigners speak. The mushrooms have a divine spirit. They always had it for us, but the foreigners arrived and frightened it away. It seems no one carried the burden of Teran's words more than Maria Sabina. I mean, it, it really cannot be understated the sheer suffering one woman endured for actions well beyond her control. Wasan would die the following year in 1986, living to be 88 years old. Far from a life of poverty, Wasan only continued to expand his exploration and knowledge of traditional spiritual practices worldwide, authoring a number of books on the topic. As I mentioned, Wasan expressed remorse for the effects of his visitation and towards the end of his life was quoted as saying, Since the white men came looking for the mushrooms, they have lost their magic. But do his words really hold any weight? Sure. The argument could be made that after his original sin of sharing his experience in Wodla de Jimenez, the aftermath was really out of his control. Still, after the two's friendship went cold, there's no evidence that Wasan ever attempted to support the woman he quite literally owed his career to. Prior to this, Wasan had not made a name for himself in the field of mycology, and who knows what he would have been able to do without her support. Instead, in a pattern as old as colonialism, the keepers of knowledge saw their wisdom taken from them, twisted, contorted, until it barely resembled the original concept. While embrace may not be the proper word, today, Oudle de Jimenez has succumbed to their identity as a psychedelic tourist attraction outsiders made it into. Step into just about any market and you'll immediately be overcome by mushroom sculptures, jewelry, posters, knickknacks. In an area once filled with people who truly loved and adored the woman, then exiled and hated her, the current creepy branding of her name throughout the town serves as a reminder of just how bizarre martyrs are treated in death. Her face appears on t-shirts, blankets, the side of taxis, a local restaurant was named after her, 
For anyone who's been in a Spencer's or a Hot Topic before, chances are you may have seen the iconic photo of her taking a drag from what appears to be a joint, a motion that has led to this image of her seeping deeper into recreational drug culture. For the record, it's really just a cigar, and if the proceeds were in any way supporting her family, perhaps I wouldn't find it to be as stupid as a Che Guevara t-shirt being sold in the Mall of America, but because they don't, I find it to be just another cheesy, tacky way to identify as one of the rebel cool kids. But if you feel like rocking it, do you, I guess. The world of psychedelic research, after remaining largely dormant through the 70s and 80s, began to experience a resurgence in various countries, leading to unprecedented human clinical trials, with several studies showing extremely positive results regarding potential for therapeutic benefits of psilocybin, LSD, MDMA, and other psychoactive substances. Culturally, we too are seeing a revitalization of styles and images in our fashion, film, music, and entertainment beyond. Things like circular sunglasses, blue pattern pants and shirts, stock shelves of stores who never would have thought to carry them a decade ago. Books like number one bestseller, How to Change Your Mind, written by Michael Pollan, previously known for The Omnivore's Dilemma, takes a scientific, well-rounded approach to psychedelics and consciousness. Movies like Midsommar, Booksmart, Inherent Vice, and The Lighthouse all depict psychedelia to varying degrees. Also, highly recommend all of them. Prior to the pandemic, venues nation and worldwide featured artists whose music and visuals drip psychedelia, prompting one of my favorite internet jokes. I love it when they play music at the drug festival. While psilocybin remains largely illegal internationally, certain areas have varying degrees of legality. In Brazil, Although psilocybin is technically illegal, they cannot criminalize psychedelic mushrooms under their constitution, leading to a widespread online market. Mushrooms are legal in the British Virgin Islands, wherever they grow naturally, and while the sale is technically criminalized, the territory sees a widespread brick-and-mortar market without much persecution. Certain countries, especially ones that see a lot of North American and European tourists, tend to have look-the-other-way policies regarding the sale of naturally growing psychoactive substances. Beyond mushrooms, things like ayahuasca retreats have become so commonplace, literally millions are spent annually by foreigners, largely wealthy Americans, traveling to Peru, Brazil, and other Latin American nations to seek guidance and psychedelic healing from the incredibly intense experience. On May 7, 2019, Denver became the first city, therefore the first place in the United States, to decriminalize hallucinogenic mushrooms in a close 50.6 yes, 49.4 no final vote count. Since then, the cities of Ann Arbor, Michigan, Oakland and Santa Cruz, California, and Washington, D.C. have followed suit. On November 3, 2020, I, along with millions of other Oregonians, voted on an initiative to legalize psilocybin for mental health at licensed centers while also decriminalizing the possession of small amounts of all drugs statewide. As this is released, the law has just come into effect. It will be interesting to see how Oregon officials practice these policies and which states follow suit in the coming years. As we see governments, quote-unquote, rooted in Western ideology, beginning to sanction psychedelic substances, the question must be raised, how do we pay our dues? Although I do believe in the benefits of legalization, it could be argued that this is just another way to appropriate a beautiful, sacred tradition stolen from a people who have remained oppressed for the past 500 years. While I do not have the answer, I will say this. In the Pacific Northwest, there is an abundance of naturally growing hallucinogenic mushrooms. Further, as legalization grows and eventually turns recreational, I can assure you there is not a lack of very intrigued Americans interested in becoming the first wave of legal hallucinogenic mushroom farmers. While I am not saying people should never visit Uudle de Jimenez or take away all their tourism income, perhaps, slowly, over time, we can at least let the communities who open the world to us once again be allowed to use their divine, native mushrooms in peace and private. When Usan first arrived in Huitla de Jimenez, Filimon described Maria Sabina as una señora sin mancha, a woman without sin. I believe this should be her legacy. She never became a rich woman through the frequent visitations, never tried to exploit anyone through her actions, yet faced the worst consequences. She seemed to be a truly remarkable woman, and I think that while the exploitation of her imagery is problematic, 
her name should not be lost among the large amounts of European and American white men so frequently mentioned in the revolutionizing of psychedelia. With that, I'll leave you with a poem by Maria Sabina, one she chanted during ceremonies. Quick note, the repeated phrase, says, is her way of crediting the divine mushrooms, believing these to be their words, and her merely serving as the interpreter. And, you know, if you think this is cheesy, if I can, it's my thing, whatever, fuck you. Here it goes. Because I can swim in the immense. Because I can swim in all forms. Because I am the launch woman. Because I am the sacred opossum. Because I am the lord opossum. I am the woman, book that is beneath the water, says. I am the woman of the populous town, says. I am the shepherdess who is beneath the water, says. I am the woman who shepherds the immense, says. I am the shepherdess, and I come with my shepherd, says. Because everything has its origin, and I come going from place to place from the origin. <laughs>